All right, welcome to Free Will, Science, and Religion. My name is George Ortega. I'm here with Chandler Klebs. And today we're talking about something really, really interesting. Basically, mo- many of our podcasts have to do with explaining why free will is impossible, why we human beings do not have a free will. However, you know, along with that understanding comes the question, well, if our wills are not up to us, if our thoughts, feelings, actions are not up to us, who or what do we ascribe them to? Okay, so um, Chandler, start us off. What, how, how should we theorize, um, you know, th- what, what should we ascribe our, our, our thoughts, our intelligence, you know, our actions to? Well, here's how I would put it. I would say that our intelligence as well as our consciousness is not something – that all of a sudden magically appears once you um, have a fully developed brain and nervous system. Because I don't think it's something that evolved, but rather something that had to always be there. Um, And the reason I say this is because how do you get even the idea of consciousness from living cells if those living cells aren't already conscious? And how do you get any idea of intelligence or know-how to be able to respond to your environment unless the cells already know how to respond to that environment? And when you have an injury, your, your blood cells, you know, the, the skin cells, it all just heals it up, you know, unless it's too major, you know, um, and you heal. And you don't have to consciously in your, your brain – um, start that process. It's, it's already done by your cells. And so I think that life is much more beautiful, mysterious, and amazing than people seem to believe. All right. Um, I agree with you. I, I think, you know, there has to be kind of like some kind of fundamental consciousness, intelligence. But let's, let's describe in a bit more detail how we get there, how we get to this, um, this conclusion, this understanding. Okay, we, we start off with, with the recognition that what we do, what other organisms do, um, what other animals do, etc., is not freely willed. You know, it, it's not up to us. And one way we can describe um, what actually controls our actions and thoughts is, is mechanistically through this law of cause and effect that Essentially, our thoughts, you know, our actions are the direct causal result result of, let's say, most generally, the state of the universe at the prior moment, you know, prior to whatever is done, whatever we do. And then the, um, the cause of that state of the universe is naturally the previous state. And the cause of that state is the previous state. So, so essentially, whatever we human beings do, whatever other animals do, can be mechanistically, completely causally explained by the evolving states of the universe that lead up to whatever action or thought it is. Otherwise, I mean, to posit otherwise would be to suggest that our actions and thoughts are taking place outside of the universe. And so that, that you know, that... Um, is an impossibility. Yeah, that sounds absurd to suggest it happens outside the universe because the universe is everything that exists anyway. Um, So yeah, because if your thoughts and actions did not stem from the prior state of the universe, well, what would they come from? Exactly. All right, so we have a kind of like a mechanistic explanation, but now let's let's turn to kind of like the biology, the – the – you know, the, the more organic explanation. Um, so we, um, we have thoughts and they're basically the result of, of our brains. Um, so in, in, in the sense of our brains, I think what we can do is describe our brains as amazing processors of information. And, and we can use the analogy of a computer. A, a computer takes a lot of information, puts it together, 
and it problem solves. It reaches conclusions based on its programming. And so I think our brain does the same thing, you know, based on our, you know, evolutionary genetics or on, on our heredity or our genetic coding. It um, basically, you know, processes what, what the senses perceive, what, what even the cells perceive, and then makes determinations, makes um makes conclusions, makes changes. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds pretty accurate. Um, and the, everything is so interconnected and everything's so quick, the way that our bodies work, um, that I don't think like, yeah, I, I don't think of the, um, the brain as some kind of a thing that processes information that's somehow separate from the rest of the body because some people almost make it sound that way and and I guess what they're what they're doing is they're ignoring that all the sensations every type of input every type of consciousness every uh, feeling smell sight uh, hearing you know smell all of these things are inputs which is much more complex than what a, a computer experience is you know because there's keystrokes and there's and there's you know mouse clicks and mo mouse movement events and stuff with the computer but what biological things experience the sensory overload the input coming from so many different ports you might say is way is way more than any computer built by humans could handle yeah i completely agree we've got the five senses we have all these other kinds of like the sense of balance i mean there's there's various inputs coming from different organs from and all right, so like basically what, what we're describing, though, is like um, to put it in the context of free will, um, our brain, you know, in as you're explaining, in cooperation with in conjunction with the other organs of our body and perhaps other, you know, aspects of, of reality outside of our body. And well, no, certainly like the environment, you know, the environment is certainly an input that's being received by the senses. So like basically our brain processes this information and, and, and arrives at conclusions. And again, I think like one, one way we could understand this is like with computers, you have like the hardware engineers and the software engineers that basically through a series of, ex, of experiments of, of just, you know, trial and error, they basically come up with these, you know, these machines and the software to run the machines that I think we have to like essentially define as intelligent behavior, intelligent actions. And again, we, we, we use that same description of that kind of behavior to what, what our brains do. You know, essentially our brains are constantly processing information and coming up with intelligent conclusions, intelligent answers to whatever needs to be described. Now, Chandler, so the, 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 where we're at is the like, so, you know, certainly we human beings, just like computers, um, do, do things, you know, um, um, basically manifest processes that have to be uh, termed intelligent but the problem is that because we don't have a free will, this intelligence can't be fundamentally ascribed to us. So given that, how would you, how would you define or explain the intelligence that we manifest? Well, it's interesting because it seems to be a universal intelligence, one that doesn't belong to anybody. It's sort of public domain. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of yeah, because and you have to get back into well, what is us? You know, because if we are a collection of cells, it's not like there's one cell or one one single gene in a strand of DNA that is us. And so, like, I sort of get how the self is an illusion, <laughs> you know. And so this is weird. So I think of I think of me. As life, I think of you as life, almost like that we're all part of the universe and we're all life. So it's sort of like we are all part of one universal life, one gigantic beehive or something like that. 
Well, it's interesting you you mentioned that, Chandler, because basically last night I was reviewing uh, James Lovelock's theory of Gaia, where he, he, I think, proposed this back in the 60s, and at first it was ridiculed, and it basically describes the Earth as a self-regulating organism, that the, we, the life forms on the, uh, in the Earth basically have this kind of like communication with and cooperation with uh, the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and the temperature and, you know, all the, these other climactic um, aspects of our, our, um, of our planet. So, 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 you know, I, I, I definitely see how, you know, how you're describing this, this kind of like intelligence as pervading, you know, um, I guess reality outside of ourselves. It, 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 it does have, you know, it's, it's empirical validation, but now let's, let's explore, in other words, like in, in terms of like trying to understand the intelligence that guides our brain you know, our human brains to then, you know, do what we do. Let's explore this from a more fundamental level. Let's explore this from, from the, um, the evolutionary perspective of, of random mutation, you know, of, of like DNA and how, how we evolve from, from one, you know, from having certain attributes to others, to, you know, to, to different species. Yeah, because the, you know, the the kind of randomness that you and I think is absurd is the uncaused randomness, like it just happened for no reason. Um, and some people um, mean it as in there's no intention, like there's no plan. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm not so sure I can go with that randomness either. Like, I think that living cells may intentionally um, try to to build organisms that are better adapted to the environment. So I think there might might be um, an intention. There's not too much you can say about uh, uh, you know an in, intentions, but it does certainly appear that some adaptations, like the Venus flytrap and the moths changing color to adapt to the trees and stuff, um, might indicate that. Right. So let's, I mean, cause like, let's explore this concept of randomness because basically, you know, some people w- would suggest that our, our human thoughts are somehow free because they're random. And that, that makes no sense because like, you know, in the strong sense, random means without order and without cause that they, things just happen. And, you know, certainly that wouldn't describe a free will because they, if things are just happening, quote unquote, randomly, then our wills or we could not be causing these things to happen. But, but let's explore this, this concept of randomness in terms of random mutation, in terms of like this, this evolutionary process. So you're right. If, I think we have to reject the notion of randomness as, as a causality and um, uh, of randomness without order. So then like what we're left with is that um, evolution – is not a um, and all right. Just um, there's one use of the word random that I think is correct in this, but it's a different use than than I think most people um, apply to it. And basically, I think when Darwin and the the developers of evolution used the term random, I think what they were what they meant was that like it was a perceived randomness. In other words, it was an acknowledgement that certain processes were happening in terms of evolution, in terms of, you know, um, DNA replications and, and, and random mutations that we human beings simply were not able to be aware of or, or able to, to understand its processes. So that, I think, is the, the randomness that, that, um, that they refer to. And so let's explore that. So, like, in other words, like, if, if the... Um, if the DNA that, that I think, you know, basically gives instructions to the cells on, in terms of how to act is, is, um, is acting according to a, an ordered process, what else can we say about this DNA? Well, it has to have some type of intelligence, some type of awareness. It has to have knowledge of how to respond to an environment, I would think. 
Exactly. Exactly. In other words, why why would why would DNA why would um the um the genes the chromosomes within DNA um change at all? Exactly. Because yeah, yeah, it's good thing you brought that up because. It, unless there was some reason for there being a mutation, well, there wouldn't be a mutation. If, if there was no cause for the mutation, yeah, there, th then all all genes would be exactly the same. The, there wouldn't even be any kind of change. We would all look the same. And <laughs> exactly. All right. Now, like, so now, like, we we generally understand evolution in terms of like you know, thousands or millions of years that, you know, it's a very slow process. But, you know, recent scientists have discovered a kind of a, um, an evolution that's actually, you know, quite, quite um, fast. It, it's called microevolution. And the way they describe it is like in a region in England, there are these moths that had white wings. They were basically white moths and they their habitat was these trees with with whitish bark which would allow them to blend in and camouflage themselves so as to escape predators now what happened was in that region of, in england um because of the industrial revolution um a lot of soot and carbon dioxide and, and pollution was put into the air and it actually colored these tree the bark on these trees dark you know, the, it made the, the tree bark dark. And so what happened was, and, and this isn't the, the same mechanism that, that a chameleon uses because a chameleon changes color in a way that's not um, DNA driven. It's just part of their, their natural biology. But these moths actually at the DNA level um, were able to, within the span of, I think, perhaps uh, years or decades, um, make a change so that their wings turned dark to to match the 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 newly dark um bark on the trees that they uh, inhabit and then what what's equally amazing is that then eventually that region in England cleaned its air it it, it began to kind of like pull the pollution out of the out of the atmosphere out of the air and when that happened the trees began to turn white again and again, through this DNA process, the, the, the moths, the, the, the wings of the moth, the moths themselves turned from black to white again. Now, this, this, this again, these are DNA um, mutations. They're not, they're not like, you know, just simply um, characteristics of the organism as with a chameleon. Yeah. It, it, yeah, for example, you know, they're, like, you know, humans put on different clothes. You know, we change clothes with warmer or cold weather. We, we just change the outside. We just change the clothes we wear to adjust to it. But with these organisms, they that live, you know, in extremely hot and extremely cold places, they have had to adapt to where without the use of any artificial man-made equipment, they are still able to live because internally their DNA has changed. They they grow hair, they lose hair, all sorts of stuff like that. Exactly. So then, all right, with, with that example, with the example of the moths, with, with any example that relates to DNA, we have to then posit. I mean, like 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 you were saying before, these changes don't happen for no reason. They These changes are responses to environmental challenges, to to um to trying to seek environmental um advantages so then the question so then the question becomes so like basically like you know we know dna is is made of 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 um chromosomes of genes chromosomes and that the chromosomes are made of like four different chemicals that that bind to each other in different ways and that's what what forms the the different genes now we know that, but like I think what we also have to uh, conclude is these um, these gene these um, DNA these genes must be communicating with the um, with the outside environment in order to be able to understand how to change. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and uh, here's a great example, George. 
I was out at my fr my mom has this friend who has who has a kind of a farm and she has some horses and this lady I was petting and brushing this horse and this lady was explaining about their hair how in the winter they grow this winter coat of fur but in the summer they shed it and so there has to be some sort of way of the cells responding knowing oh it's time to start shedding this hair it's time to start growing this extra coat of hair like there yeah so there's there's something here that i think humans have been ignoring a fundamental part of nature and the nature of living things that for too long they've just been dismissing exactly cuz like with evolution basically you know the, the the general understanding or perhaps misunderstanding is that it's a random process in other words like it's like just like there's no order in it and that doesn't make sense cuz that that would be kind of like suggesting that you could like put the materials let's say that comprise a building in in one geographic area and then expect them to somehow magically just organize themselves into a a, a structure you know and and so that it's just an impossibility. So, so yes. So we 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 then have to like conclude that um, that at the DNA level, I think at the cellular level, and also at the level of the organs that make up the human body. You know, certainly at the level of the brain, there has to be process. There has to, it's it, it can't be random mutation. There has to be an ordered, um, purpose-driven intelligence that's guiding these processes. Yes, I see what you're saying here because it sort of almost sounds like who was the name of that philosopher that said uh, was it Lucippus who said nothing happens at random but but everything for a reason and by necessity was that absolutely guy? yeah yeah Lucippus yeah yeah well you know what if you've seen the movie Kung Fu Panda there's Master Shifu and he's like there are no accidents. You know, it sounds almost similar. Like people are making it sound like things are, oh, it's just random. No reason. It's just an accident. And I think that's I think that's a false statement. I think that's just a dismissal of something they don't understand and they don't they're not looking into it further. But I'm more than happy to look into it. Exactly. And let's take the analogy, for example, of computers again. You have these like hardware engineers and software engineers, you know, basically doing intelligent experimentation they're trying like certain materials in terms of like the, to build the memory for computers and to build the certain components for computers and a lot of what they tried didn't work they might try like a thousand different kinds of materials configured in, in, in a thousand different ways until they come up with with the solution with the answer and with the software again they might try different approaches to various software problems before they come up with, with the answer, and it's an intelligently driven process, and we can apply this analogy to the DNA. And in terms of like this quote unquote random mutation, basically the 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 DNA is basically somehow being communicated to by the environment, and it's it's basically trying to figure out how to best address what whatever it's being called upon to address whether it's like you know the, the need to more for more food a, a a more um a more hospitable climate whatever it is that the environment cha challenge might 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 be but again i think we have to acknowledge that just as like computer programmers and and hardware engineers use intelligence to guide their experimentation the dna must use a similar kind of intelligence to guide its it's it's mutation and evolution. Hey, yeah, you know, uh, to use a more common example that more people will, will understand is Thomas Edison learned a lot of different ways not to make a light bulb <laughs> until finally found one way that worked. <laughs> That's a perfect example, Chandler. Exactly. So in other words, like, so yes, you know, the 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 mutations. There are many mutations, and what works is carried on. You know, and what what is isn't um what doesn't work isn't but even even like explaining that so like you know first you have to like you have to describe intelligence to the process that that will determine oh this is working you know somehow like i mean it could be like in terms of like for example like the organism receives more food or the organism is like in the case of the moths um better camouflage to to protect their safety from predators but there's got to be some kind of like an intelligent evaluation 
of the outcome of these mutations that determines, oh, this is working, this is, this is, this is a, a correct solution. Ah, so what we're saying here is there is a will, there is a desire of something that, that you know, an organism wants to achieve, and then the consciousness, the sensory input tells it how much what's happening satisfies that desire or not. And so where there's a will, there's a way. Chandler, excellent. Yes. So in other words, like there is a guiding, there's, there are guiding desires just have as we human beings have like these guiding motivations, drives, um, the, the drive to survive, the, to seek pleasure and avoid pain, that these, 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 these molecules, these cells, these DNA, you know, molecules have that must have that same kind of will driven um, motivation. Mm, this is very interesting because this is something that you can observe when watching flies. <laughs> and, they're, and they're tiny and they're annoying, but they, but they want your food. They smell your food and they come crawling all over your food trying to eat your food. And, and I've seen this. I, I've seen that I'm eating something and there's crumbs too small for me to, to eat from it anymore. But then a fly comes and, and I just let it have it like, hey, it wants to eat it. And I'm like, I'm going to let it have its short happiness. They only live for two days anyway. So I'm going to let it have its happiness and eat my food. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. But obviously they have a desire to, for that food. They smell it. And, and, and if you try to swat them, it doesn't work anyway because well, you know, they see you. <laughs> They're conscious. They are so conscious and they have s such eyes that when – that's part, part – George, that's part of why I see the consciousness of fly, ant, and the bee. And then people say that these that these babies aren't conscious at nine months into the pregnancy or after they're born. They're still not conscious. And I'm like, what have you been smoking? <laughs> no, you're completely right. All right, Chandler, we've just got about three minutes left. So let's encapsulate what we've been saying now. Essentially, you know, we human beings don't have a free will Yet we do many, many actions. We have many thoughts that we can characterize as purposeful, intelligent, you know, actions and thoughts. And because we don't have free will, we can't describe this intelligence to ourselves. So we have to ascribe it to something outside of ourselves. And I think what we've been exploring is the fact that like that at the very small level of DNA, and I think maybe, you know, of, of, of chromosomes and genes and all, we can find this kind of same guiding, purpose-driven behavior that w we must, you know, uh, I think um, we're compelled to define that behavior also as intelligent. Yes, I think we have to. I think we really have to look at living organisms, the big and the small, and conclude that there's a, a will, a desire, an intelligence among each of them. And, you, and size is really an illusion, too, because we're all made up of tinier particles anyway. We're all made up of tiny cells. And so you can't look at an ant or a bee or a, a fly and say that it's not conscious just because it's smaller. And you, can't, and you can't say that an elephant is more conscious just because it's bigger. So, yes, a will and consciousness, it seems to be characteristic characteristics of life, living organisms. Yeah, and I think we might even go further. For example, like the, the evolutionary changes that, that DNA molecules are capable of, of achieving, whether it, it, they achieve them over millions of years or over decades like with the moths, are far more complex than, than we human beings can do you know, with our brains. So yes, we'd have to have you know describe describe these processes at, at as as at least at the very least as intelligent as as our human intelligence, All right? Chandler, we've got about um forty seconds left, so like we this is something that we have to revisit again and again because basically like you know once we understand that free will is an illusion, the next very essential question, the next exploration is like fine if if nothing is really up to us as human beings. Who or what is it up, up to? And as you were saying before, this has religious implications. This has, this has scientific implications. This has like it, – it's basically an understanding of who we really are most fundamentally. And that's what it's about. We're trying to find out who we are, why we do what we do. 
Okay. Okay. Chandler, thanks. This has been a great episode. We'll be back again with free will, science, and religion. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next time. Okay.